I've been working on a print order recently, and it's a fairly large print order, not just in the number of prints, and there's some of the test prints I've been working on, but also in the size of those prints. A lot of them are gonna be 30 by 45 and 40 by 60. So in addition to getting the proofing and the colors and the contrast and the brightness of the prints correct, uh, doing the enlargements and cleaning up the print files really carefully for print set size is really important because when you print that large, any sort of issues, so noise, chromatic aberration, dust spots, um, just any artifacts from uh, sloppy editing. Who does sloppy editing? Taking care of all those issues is really important. We don't often get a chance to print really large print files, a lot of us. So I thought I'd take you kind of behind the scenes and show you at least how I'm going about it. The first step for me in getting an image file ready for printing is to do soft proofing on the computer using the profile for the paper and the printer that I'm gonna be printing with. And that gives me a simulation on the screen of what the image will look like printed at that output. And then what I try to do with that is get the printed output to more closely match what my original image looked like on the screen because screens and printed images are inherently different and because there's so many possible ways to print an image both on different printers and on different types of media that there's no way that we can get them all to match. So what we do is we develop our images for the screen and then when we're ready to print to an output, we use a profile to try to get the output to better match what we originally saw on our screen. You can do this type of soft proofing in Photoshop and I have a video on YouTube where I show how to do Photoshop soft proofing and I'll link to that in the description. For this demonstration, I'll show how to do it in Lightroom and I actually really like doing soft proofing in Lightroom because Lightroom makes it easy and when I have a whole bunch of images that I'm soft proofing for a print job like this, it really streamlines the process. You can see down here in my film strip that I have two copies of each image. Uh, the first one is the actual image, and the second one is a virtual copy. You can tell by the little uh, page corner there. It's a virtual copy that has been soft proofed, and when I hover over that, you can see that I've soft proofed it to the Pro 4880 Premium Luster Photo Paper Profile. So I've already done all the soft proofing on these image files, but let me show you how that works. So here's the image, here's the original, and I want to soft proof this. So I check this little soft proofing. This is in the develop module. I check the soft proofing checkbox. And what that does is it asks me if I want to create a proof copy. And I do, because I don't want to adjust my original. I want to make my adjustments to the copy that will be the proof. So I say, yes, go ahead and create a proof copy. And now I have two proof copies because I already had the one I had done previously. So here's the new one I just made. And now, I set a profile, and in this case, I want to profile to that 4880 Premium Luster photo paper. And if you don't see the profile that you want to use for soft proofing here in this drop down list, you need to click Other and then go to your computer and find that profile on your computer and add it to the list. If you're soft proofing using a profile that's not from your printer, it's from a lab or some other printer somewhere, uh, you need to get that profile. You can see here I have one for Bay Viewing, here I have one for Aspen Creek Photo, here's Lum uh, Lumachrome, and uh, here's another um, lab that I use sometimes as well. So I have all those profiles loaded here in Lightroom so I can use those for soft proofing as well. But in this case we're going to use the Premium Luster Photo Paper. I always uh, use the relative rendering intent for my uh, soft proofing and my printing, and I want to simulate the paper color. This makes the image look really crappy on the screen, but if the image is gonna be warmed or cooled or any color shifts that are gonna happen because of that paper and ink colors, that's what's gonna show you that. So you do wanna have that box checked. And the other thing I do is I view this side by side with the before and the after, or in this case, maybe uh, top and bottom. So this way I can see both images. This is the before, this is how the image should look. This is what it's gonna look like, the simulation of printed on paper. And now when I make adjustments over here to the proof preview, uh, I can see how it matches and I'm trying to get it to more closely match this. Now I may not get it to match that exactly, but we can work with that a little bit. So I can see that it needs to be a little brighter. 
So I'm going to bring the overall exposure up a bit. I can see that that particular paper and ink combination is cooling things a little bit, so I want to warm it a bit. And I think it's a little less contrast, so I may want to bring up contrast slightly. And I may also want to bring up a little clarity for that lost contrast. And I may want to bring up the vibrance and saturation just slightly to get some of those colors. So now I feel like my original and that proof or what it's going to look like when it prints match a little closer. Somewhere in there. All right, so that's it. That's how you do soft proofing in Lightroom. So now when I leave the proof view and go back to the single view, here's my original and here's my proofed version. And you see my original is how I intend it to be. The soft proof is much brighter and more contrasty and more saturated, but when printed to that particular output, it should come out of the printer now looking like that. So that's soft proofing in Lightroom. When I go to print, I want to print the proofed version, not the original. So when I'm ready to print my hard proofs here in my own studio, I can come right over to the print module in Lightroom and I can change paper sizes and print sizes and all that. But at this point now, I'm going to print that proofed copy to the printer and I'm going to make sure that I'm using that same profile that I used to soft proof it with. And so now I can just print this and that'll output my test print. So as you saw, I did my soft proofing in Lightroom using the profile for Premium Luster Photo Paper on an Epson printer because even though I can't print that large here on my office printer, I am ordering from a lab that uses the exact same printer and inks and papers as that. So I'm pretty confident about being able to do uh, soft proofing on my screen and then hard proofing by printing out some test prints. And these are eight by 12 test prints so I can fit two of them on um, uh, whatever this is, a 13 by 19, I think, piece of paper. So doing all of them in test prints and hard proofing. And if I see any issues in how those images are coming out, and I can correct those before I order the big prints. To verify that hard proofing on my own printer is a good idea, so I printed a test print of this on my printer and then ordered a proof print from the lab that's on the same paper and using the same printer and inks. And there I can check and see that, yeah, the two are very closely matched between my printer and what's gonna come from the lab. I also printed on a slightly different, actually it's a totally different paper and a totally different printer. And you can just verify there that that one is not matching my proof print. But as long as I keep within the same inks and printer and profiles, then I can be pretty confident that what I'm seeing in my test prints here in my studio is gonna match what I'm seeing coming from the lab. So if you don't have your own printer to make test prints on, or if you're printing on some sort of media, the big prints will be on something like uh, canvas or aluminum or something like that, that you don't have the ability to match with your own printer, then I would highly suggest at least ordering test prints uh, in a smaller size from the lab and keeping all the other variables equal other than size. And that way it'll be inexpensive, maybe just five by sevens or eight by tens or something like that. So you can evaluate brightness and contrast and color and make any corrections that you need to make before you spend a lot of money and order those really large full size prints. And I know that companies like HD Aluminum, uh, even with aluminum prints, I know HD Aluminum offers small five by seven test prints when you're ordering a bigger file that you can check out the test print first. And if I like how the, uh, the test print came out, if I think it matches my intentions, then I know I'm now ready to size that to the full size that it's gonna be printed, which is 40 by 60 in this case. And then that's the file that I'm gonna upload to the print lab. So the next step is to output this proofed copy. So I'm gonna go back to the library module and export 
that from Lightroom. And I'm gonna export it as a TIFF file. And I'm gonna make sure that it's in the color space that I'm gonna be printing. In this case, the printer I'm using doesn't print the Profoto RGB color space. They want the Adobe RGB color space. So I'm gonna output it as that. And uh, unless there's some really far out there colors, it shouldn't shift the colors in the image. And this is gonna be a full size image file. I'm not going to resize it at all. So I leave that unchecked. I'm not gonna do any output sharpening here at this point. I'll do that in the next step. And so I'm just ready to export. And in this case, I'm just gonna export this one to my desktop just for the video. I actually have a folder where I'm exporting all of the images for this particular uh, print order. But in this case, for this demo, I'll just do it out on the desktop. And for the enlarging, I'm going to size the image for printing using a piece of software called Gigapixel AI by Topaz. I've found recently that in most cases, this piece of software really does an excellent job of up or interpolating image files for large printing. However, Photoshop also does a pretty good job and in some cases or in some parts of an image, I like how Photoshop does it better. So what I actually do is, I'm kind of overkill on this actually, but I want them to look really good. I want them to look their best. So I upsize using Gigapixel AI. I also upsize using Photoshop and then I can blend the best characteristics of the two upsized versions together in Photoshop, and I'll show that. But let's do the sizing in Gigapixel AI first. So I'll open the image, which I put on my desktop right there. So I'll go ahead and open that into Gigapixel AI. And then over here, I need to set the parameters for how I'm gonna size it. I want it to be 60 inches wide. So I've got all that set, width 60 inches. I'm gonna print it at 300 pixels per inch. And the settings, I just leave them at their default settings that are here in Gigapixel AI, which is 0.5 and 0.5 for suppress noise and remove blur. I haven't had a huge amount of success in really getting a better results by changing those. And then down here, I can choose where it's gonna be saved to. So I want it to just go back into the source folder, which is actually out on my desktop in this case. That's where it came from and uh, the output file name, it's gonna be the same file name, except for on the end, I'm gonna put Gigapixel AI 40 by 60, so I know that that's what I've done to size it. I don't wanna convert the file format right now, I wanna leave it as a TIFF file for now. In the preview windows here, we can see what the original looks like compared to what the size version done by Gigapixel AI is gonna look like. Now, this is a little deceiving because this is if we printed the, uh, the original without doing any interpolation. If we just printed the pixels that the image currently has in it at 40 by 60, that's what we'd get. But you wouldn't probably, do, you know, I wouldn't do that. I'm only gonna upsize or interpolate this image using some sort of software. So we'll see later that how Photoshop would upsize this image compared to how Gigapixel AI upsizes the image aren't as far off as what we see here. And actually let's go to an area of better detail so we can just compare a little better what it's doing. So you can see here is with no interpolation and here we can see much better detail in that foliage. And if we go up to the trees, maybe on the C stack back there, we can see how it's just making everything nice and sharp and crisp edges and clean. And also in areas that potentially can get a little noisy. Uh, I don't know if you can see that in the video, but areas that potentially get a little noisy uh, really get cleaned up by Gigapixel AI, just much smoother. So in, in general, it makes a really nice output. So when I have everything set how I want it, I'm just gonna say start, and it's gonna chew away on that, and it takes this program quite a bit of time to actually complete the upsizing, especially when we're going to that big. So it's 18, thousand pixels by 12,000 pixels is what this is being sized up to. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead to when this is actually done. Now I'm gonna open up both of the image files of this image, the one that's just the uh, standard size TIFF output from Lightroom 
and the sized 40 by 60 output from Gigapixel AI. I'm gonna open them both in Photoshop. I go to open, browse to my desktop. There they both are. So I'll select them both and open them. And the Gigapixel AI one wants to come through camera raw, which is fine. I just need to check and make sure that it's not changing any of the parameters. So the pixels per inch, the total pixel dimensions and the color space all look right. So I can say, yes, open that image in Photoshop. And now I have them both open. Here's the 40 by 60. And here's the one that hasn't been sized yet. And now I want to size using Photoshop's interpolation. So I can just come up to image, image size. And I want to size this to 60 inches wide by 40 inches high at 300 pixels per inch. And I'll leave the way that it's going to do that sizing set to automatic. So Photoshop can choose what it thinks is the best in this situation and click OK. And now I have one that has been sized in Photoshop to 40 by 60 and one that's been sized in Gigapixel I to 40 by 60. So now I want to get these stacked together into a single image file or image document. And there's a lot of different ways I could go about doing that. But in this case, I'm going to select the move tool and use this technique. I'm going to hold down the shift key with the move tool and click on the Photoshop size document and drag it up to the tab of the other one and then back down, still holding the shift key and release. And that now puts the Photoshop size version on top and the Gigapixel AI version is on the bottom. Now I'm gonna zoom in to 100%, so we're viewing actual pixels, and I'm gonna scroll over to an area here that has a lot of detail, both in the plants and in the rocks and in the water, and what we're seeing now is how Photoshop sized it, what it looks like, and this is how Gigapixel AI sized it. You can see a lot cleaner, clearer detail in a lot of the rocks and places like that. The water is also much cleaner and sharper, and a lot of what we see going on over in the foliage on the side also cleaner and sharper. So for a lot of this, I'm liking what's coming out of the Gigapixel AI version much better, but sometimes as I'm looking around, I find areas that I don't like how Gigapixel AI uh, sized it. And in those cases, all I do, like I can see some of these branches here on the trees look a little crunchy, a little funky. And so I want to bring through the Photoshop version of that to uh, kind of just smooth out some of those problematic areas. So to do that, all I need to do is add a black mask to this top layer, which alter option, clicking on the mask button or this button in the TK panel will add that black mask for you. And then I can just use a white paintbrush at probably not full opacity, maybe at 40% uh, opacity. So I can just slowly work with those areas that look a little too sharp or a little funky or a little weird and just bring in a little bit of the Photoshop and the combination of those in a lot of cases look better. So then I'll work all the way around the whole image looking for anything that I think doesn't quite look right in the Gigapixel AI version and mask through a little bit of the Photoshop. And looking all around, you know, a lot of times in some of the detailed areas, I'll find little things that don't look quite right. This image though, for the most part, is looking pretty good. I think some of these leaves are looking just a little bit kind of over sharp or a little cartoony maybe again. So this is where just doing a 40% sweep over that, you get kind of a little bit of both the Photoshop and the Gigapixel AI version, and that helps with that as well. So I keep working through that until I've got that all looking good. And when I do, I'm ready to flatten this. And this will combine the characteristics depending on how I did my masking of the parts I want of both of those layers. So I'll go ahead and flatten. 
And now that we're at the full size image, so this has now been soft proofed in Lightroom so that I know that the colors and the brightness and all of that is correct for my print output. And then it's been sized both in Gigapixel AI and in Photoshop. And I've combined the best of both. So I've got the sized image that's looking as good as I can get it in terms of that. But now I wanna zoom back into 100% one-to-one uh, -one pixels and look around for any sort of issues. And what I'm looking for are any hot pixels, dust spots. There's a hot pixel right there. So I'm going to clone that out, get rid of that hot pixel. And if I find any dust spots, and the reason why I'm looking here, I've already done this to this image, but back at its normal size, some of those little tiny things like that uh, escaped me and I didn't find them. And when you blow it up like this, sometimes little dust spots or other issues come out that you didn't see otherwise. So I wanna get rid of those here now because if I can see them now, they'll certainly show up in the 40 by 60 print. Now I did do chromatic aberration removal, um, but what I do know or what I can see now is even though I did the chromatic aberration removal back in Lightroom when I first started working on this image, blown up to this size, there are some little remnants of chromatic aberration in these branches in the upper left hand corner that weren't vi really visible or not noticeable either in smaller prints or at the, uh, the native image size. So I want to get rid of that because I don't want those little pink fringes showing up in my nice big fine art print. So fortunately here in Photoshop, the TK7 panel has an action called correct chromatic aberration. And I find this really useful for fixing some of those little chromatic aberration, those kind of persistent chromatic aberrations that keep showing up. And so with the action, I want to select a radius for this blur that just makes that chromatic aberration go away. But I don't want to overdo it. So somewhere around seven or eight usually is the right pixel radius. So I'll say okay. And then the action has me paint with a white brush on the black mask. And I'll go ahead and paint at a 100% opacity, and anywhere I now see that chromatic aberration, I can just go in and paint it out and just get rid of those little fringes that are weird colors that should not show up in that nice final large print. And I would move around and look for a chromatic aberration anywhere I could find it in the image and remove it. Uh, okay. Now I'd be very careful and take lots of time and make sure I'd removed all of that. But in this case, just for the tutorial quickly, let's say that I've done it and I've got everything. So if I've now removed all potential issues, artifacts, dust spots, hot pixels, uh, chromatic aberration or anything else that might show up in that full size print, I can flatten again. And at this point, the last thing that I may want to do is add a little bit of print output sharpening. Now the Gigapixel AI on this image really did a pretty good job of kind of crisping up fine details in that image when it did the enlarging, but I may want to just check to see if I want to add a little more sharpening for the print output. So to do that, I'll duplicate that background layer, controller command J or this button in the TK7 panel. And that's what I'm gonna do my sharpening on. And I'm gonna come up to filter, sharpen, smart sharpen. And for really big images, 40 by 60, 30 by 45, I find that a pixel radius and the smart sharpen of 1.5 to two, somewhere in there, and an amount of somewhere between 180 to 200, somewhere in there, is gonna be the right amount. I'm using lens blur. You can set it to reduce a little noise if you want, although this image is really low noise because that was already done quite a bit by Gigapixel AI, but I might set that to a very small amount, just, uh, just in case. All right, now I'll click OK and apply that sharpening to the image. And in case this is moving really slow on your computer, it's moving slow on mine too. When you're applying smart sharpening to a 40 by 60 image, it takes a lot of processing power. So just be patient. 
Okay, so now this is at 100%, we can see with and without sharpening, definitely able to bring out a little bit of edge control into some of those details. And actually, when I'm evaluating print sharpening, I usually don't evaluate at 100% magnification because uh, that's really not how close we look at prints. To get a better idea of what that sharpening is actually gonna look like, 50% uh, I find to be a better indication. And so, yeah, that's adding, and I don't even know if you can really see that in the video, but that's adding a nice little bit of sharpening uh, just for that print output to get everything looking nice and finely detailed in the final print. If there were areas that I didn't like what the sharpening was doing, I could add a mask and mask the sharpening in or out. And I could also work with the opacity of that sharpening layer. But let's say that I like it, everything is fine as it is, so I can flatten one last time now. And now I'm gonna save this. This is my print file. I'm gonna save this for printing. And to save, I'm just gonna to go to File, Save As, and I'm gonna save this as a JPEG. I'm gonna save it with its Adobe RGB color space because that's what the printer wanted. It's a 40 by 60, it's been sized, it's everything, but I'm gonna save as a JPEG because it's gonna be a much smaller file. Uh, it's going to upload much faster. The print lab is gonna be much happier with you because it's not gonna take up huge amounts of space. And as long as nothing else is gonna be done to this image file, if all of the editing is done now, saving this as a JPEG at this point will not affect the print quality. Only if someone tries to size the image again or make more adjustments to the image. As long as the print lab or you or anyone else isn't gonna do anything else to this, saving it as a JPEG is okay. And I'm gonna save it at the maximum quality setting. Now I'm ready to send that off to the print lab. The full size prints can get pretty expensive if they don't come out right. So another thing I do to check my sharpening uh, on the large size images is I just print a section of the image at 100%. And that way, even though it's not the whole image, it's just a section of the image, it's actually how the image will print in its full size. So I can evaluate the sharpening and all the rest of it to make sure it's gonna look good at that size. All right, so I know that's a lot to chew on. I hope that was helpful. It's a long process. You're probably gonna to need to go back and watch each bit of that video uh, as you go through the first time. But I think if you're going to be ordering and spending a lot of money on large prints, or if it's for a, a print job and you want that order to go out and look as good for your client as possible, I think uh, going through these steps, taking the time and getting it done right is really the right thing to do. All right, thanks a lot for watching. I hope this was helpful and I look forward to seeing you again in the next one.